everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm not going to talk about cryptography today. Um, the talk I want to give today is called How to Stay Alive Even When Others Go Down. And I want to talk about how to write and test, more importantly test, um, resiliency uh, of your applications. And originally the title was Testing in Ruby, but after I made the slides, I, I realized I didn't really say that much specific to Ruby, so I, I kept it a little bit general. So um, let's talk about this guy. So I want to, the, the goal of this talk is that you should be able to, um, yeah, you should be able to be calm and like know how your application behaves. If something is on fire, if something goes down, you should be able to know exactly what will happen without freaking out, without any unknowns. And um, the main takeaway here is that you want to find out, you want to gain this confidence as early as possible and during testing and not just in production because then it's usually too late. Um, so uh, for a little background, I work at Shopify uh, on one of the infrastructure teams we have. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, anything specific to Shopify. I'm, I'm just going to use it as a couple of um, examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, this talk is not about Shopify specifically. So um, when I say how to stay alive even when others go down, um, let's let's talk about who's others. Like who, who do I who do I who do I, who do I mean when I say others? Um, and this can really be um, any kind of anything that's not the application that you're looking at right now. So if if you have a monolithic application, it's every other application besides that. Or if you have a service-oriented architecture, you're going to look at every every single service. And, and this from this point of view, others just means all the other services you have. It could be a third-party service. Maybe it's um, S3 or like some some API you're integrating with, or Maybe it's a part of your core infrastructure that's not actually the application. So, um, yeah, any of those could could um, could mean others here. Yeah. So, um, at Shopify, we we run we, we still mostly run um, a monolithic Rails application. It's a huge Rails application. There's a couple of smaller things around, but it's mostly one application. And if you if you are in the same situation, then you might say this this talk is, doesn't really apply to me. Like. Um, yeah, why, why do I even care? Um, so I want to say, for the for the purpose of this talk, I want to redefine what most people think of as a service. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, when I say service, I just mean any kind of logical unit of your application. Um, that's not necessarily a different process. It might be part of the same application, but maybe maybe it's just an abstraction. Maybe it's a, it's a class, and maybe this class has a backend that's um, some data store, or maybe there's something. Maybe it's doing some network calls, anything like that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a separate service in the in the microservice architecture kind of sense. So a um, couple of services that, by my definition of service, you might have without realizing is the database. You have uh, a caching server. Maybe you have a session store or an authentication system. Um, there's some place where you store your assets, or maybe you have a search system, so maybe that's Elasticsearch, or maybe you have a background queue system. So all these kinds of things, everything that's not part of the core application, I would consider a service. And um, yeah, so the, the goal of this talk is I want to talk about a couple of um, design patterns and best practices and things that we learned at Shopify that made a huge difference to the stability of our platform. Um, and I, I hope that um, some of those patterns are going to be useful to, to you as well. Um, you can, they, they, they were super important for us because we, um, about a year ago, we had a time where we had a lot of outages and um, we had a lot of pain from, from um, just bad design and things being coupled together that shouldn't be coupled together. And then we had this huge cleanup initiative and um, we stumbled over, over those patterns. Um, we tried them out all, and so today I want to just um, talk about what they mean and how you can use them yourself. So um, the, the one in green here, fallbacks, that's going to be the, the easiest one for you. So if, if you don't remember any of this, uh, the, the stuff I'm talking about, then this is the one that you will remember because it's super easy to do and it's a e super easy win. Um, and testing is in red because that's the one I think is the most valuable on a long term. Um, basis and the most, um, yeah, the most valuable, I would say. But um, for the beginning, let's start with timeouts. So 
but most of you probably know what, 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 what I mean when I say timeouts, but um, to, to understand why this is important, um, let's look at um, a couple of performance metrics that are usually super important for a web application. And if you, if you do run a web application, you've heard the term capacity. So um, at Shopify, we have this, um, this website where every developer can, can deploy code to a production server. And before you can do it, there's like those two graphs here. And there's a little checkbox that says, um, please look at the, the graphs before you actually pre press the deploy button. And if anything changes after the deploy in, this, in those two graphs, then you should say something. Um, so those two graphs are basically the, the most, um, if not the most important, but the most common, or the most, the, the, the two metrics that you look at first and um, when, when you ship new code, and this is response time and throughput. So response time just means um, how long does it take to handle one request, and throughput means how many requests can we handle in a given time. Um, and many of you are probably running uh, an architecture that's similar to um, the Nginx and Unicorn setup. So to understand why timeouts are important, um, maybe this is not obvious to everyone, but um, this um, bunch of workers at the bottom, um, so how, how, how Unicorn works is, when you start the process, it, it forks a couple of workers. And the important thing is that the number of workers is not, um, it's not a function of the system load or the number of requests. It, it stays fixed the whole time. So if you, if you experience higher load, there, there won't be any new workers, but the, the number of workers is always the same, um, which means when all of those workers are occupied, you can't, re um, you can't serve any requests. You're going to start queuing them, and uh, eventually, you, you will be unable to handle more requests. So if we look at this picture again, if you, um, if you work in uh, operations or if you have been around uh, during an outage, you might have seen a picture that looks more like this. And this, um, this illustrates very nicely that those two graphs um, have a very um, important relationship to each other. So uh, you can see on the right that the requests took longer to handle, and that led to what you see on the left, which means that the throughput goes down. So um, maybe that's not obvious to everyone, but um, the takeaway is that those two are related, and making requests slower because of whatever reason will um, degrade the throughput you can handle. So when we talk about capacity, um, it's, it's hard to define exactly what capacity means, but like for now, let's just say it's the maximum throughput that you can um, handle given a reasonable response time. So um, this picture here is, um, what happened here is um, somebody shipped a maintenance task that um, did some data migration on uh, one of our Redis servers. Um, and uh, they were accidentally using a Redis command that has a very high um, um, complexity, so, um, if there's a lot of keys in your Redis instance, there's a couple of commands that you should never run. Keys is one of them, or um, a couple of other ones. So what, well, what happened here is that um, every single request that, um, so the, the Redis server became unresponsive, all the requests um, timed out after two minutes or something, and um, so every web request that would talk to this Redis instance would run into this 30 second timeout, and um, this leads to a degraded um, capacity. So um, even though this is somewhat specific to, to the unicorn worker model that I um, talked about, it, it in some sense also applies to any other web server or to any other, um, um, for example, a background, background queue system as well. So anything, in the end, you are always uh, limited by the number of workers you have or the number of system resources you have. So even if you do something multi-threaded or um, something like that, you, you're still having this upper bound. So this is why it's super important to have timeouts because um, if we talk about failing, so the idea of, of timeouts is to fail fast. So failing can mean different things. So the best thing that can happen to you in an outage is that the connection is refused immediately and nothing works. The worst thing that can happen is it kind of works, but after 30 seconds it breaks. So maybe it times out after five seconds or maybe you get a connection, but after 30 seconds you realize there's no data coming in or maybe the server returns an error or something like that. So there's different ways a service can fail. Um, and the, the, the connection refuse is the best one you can get um, because the other ones can, can do a lot of damage. Um, so if we uh, look at a Ruby application, so something that we looked at, um, this is all 
a bunch of Ruby gems that we use in Shopify. Um, most of them don't even have a default timeout. So if you don't specifically set those, then you might have the same problem. So for example, the Unicorn web server is uh, by default allowing Ruby requests to take up to 60 seconds, which means that for 60 seconds, this worker is blocked and can't hand handle any new requests. Um, net HTTP as well, 60 seconds. Um, the MySQL and the Redis gems, for example, don't even have a default timer at all, which on a Linux system usually means something like um, the kernel is going to kill the connection after two minutes, um, which for something like Redis is even worse because Redis is a, um, is a single-threaded server, and um, if there is a request that takes two minutes, then no other request can be handled. Um, so what you want to do for this first, um, for, to, to apply this first pattern is you probably want to instrument all of your code, all of your clients by, I don't know, for example, you could use StatsD or maybe you're using New Relic, but you want to get some insight into what your baseline is um, and then go as low with the timeout as you can afford to. So if your baseline is like five seconds, then there's no reason why you are allowing 60 seconds because they, those outliers can, can totally ruin your, um, your stability and your, your capacity. <clears throat> so um, sometimes there's legitimate reasons why something takes a long time. So maybe there's a HTTP request that does actually usually take 60 seconds, but um, if you have that, it's probably a good idea to move that into a background job and um, don't do it in line. Um, so even though you still have the same kind of problem in, in background processing, so if you're using something like Rescue or um, Sidekick or whatever, you have the same constraint that you have a fixed number of workers and if those are occupied, you're not doing any work, but that's usually not as bad for capacity because that's not something that the browser or the, the, the customer sees. That if the background system is kind of slowed down, then that's not as big a deal as if the web server is slowed down. <clears throat> so a couple of real world examples that we saw um, is for example, the, um, the Redis commands that are slow that is that, or um, there might be slow MySQL queries, a missing index, or maybe somebody is doing an expensive join on, on a big, big table or something like that. Or um, something that we see a lot is um, if you use, um, for, for us, this is um, mostly a problem with JVM applications. So for example, we use Elasticsearch. And if you, there's this weird behavior. If you, if you give Elasticsearch too much RAM, then, uh, or if the, if the size of the heap memory is too big, it's gonna do a lot of garbage collection. Um, and often this garbage collection cycle um, stops the world and while the garbage collection is happening, it doesn't handle any requests. And if you have not enough nodes in your cluster and um, they're all doing garbage collection at the same time, this can make the service unresponsive. So um, this is not about, this is not only about services failing, but you should, you should think of the service being slow as a kind of failure mode because um, if Elasticsearch or any service just crashes and doesn't, um, doesn't accept any connections, that's not as bad as um, it being super slow. So um, yeah, just think of that. Um, something else that we saw is um, problems with the network. So maybe there's, um, for some reason, there's some packet loss or a lot of TCP retransmits, or maybe there's a, um, at the beginning, we, we had a couple, couple of um, data uh, Hadoop nodes on an, the same switch as our production servers, and they would uh, saturate the network link and cause a lot of packet loss, this kind of stuff. So this is all stuff that, can, that has caused a service disruption in Shopify that could have been prevented if we would have been using um, strict, uh, stricter timeouts. Okay, so the next pattern I want to talk about is um, something called a circuit breaker. So the main idea of a circuit breaker is that if you have an external service and you're talking to it and you're getting failures, then if you talk to it again right away after the failure, it's very likely that it's gonna fail again. So the, the idea is to give the service a little bit of time to heal, to recover by basically leaving it alone for a little while. Um, and the way this is implemented is um, you're, gonna, you're just gonna keep a count of how many errors you're seeing in a certain uh, time window and if this error count reaches the threshold, um, you're gonna switch to, um, you, you're gonna break the circuit. So um, the, the naming comes from an electrical circuit where you have fuses that break the circuit to prevent the wires from overheating and burning down the house. So this is like the analogy. Um, so the way you would do this is you, you would have a, a separate 
circuit or a separate um, circuit state for each service that you're using. So the, the errors of one service shouldn't break the circuit of the other service. Each of them only um, yeah, has its own state. So just briefly, how, how does this look like? So if you want to implement this yourself, and it's, it's pretty easy, you should do it. You should try it just as a learning experience. Um, there's basically three states, closed, which is the default state, the everything is fine state, then there's open and there's half open. So basically, closed means you're just doing your requests. If everything works, then that's fine. You're gonna stay in the closed state. If you see errors, you're gonna transition to the open state. And in this state, if there is a new um, call, or if, some, if the code tries to make another call, you immediately raise an exception. You don't even try to talk to the actual service. So this, is, um, this whole pattern is, is something that you would usually implement, um, for example, as a, as a, as a patch to the, to the driver. So for example, if it's a database, or um, you would implement this as a patch to the database driver. Um, so to the application itself, um, this is invisible. It doesn't actually know that it's not talking to the, to the service when it's getting this error. Um, and then you keep a timeout basically that says, um, if I'm in this open state and there hasn't been any errors for a couple of seconds or whatever the value is, then you're gonna transition into this half open state. And half open basically just means it's closed, but um, if there's a single error, we're gonna go back to open immediately. So it's gonna not go through this threshold again. So yeah, as I said, um, as an implementation tip, implement this at the driver level. Um, when we started experimenting with this, we sprinkled this circuit breaker code all over the code base, um, which worked as well, but it, it was very hard to maintain. And um, if you have a lot of um, developers working on the same code base, this can be a bit of a, yeah, you don't want all of your, all of your developers to know about this. And it, it's better to push it down the stack and make it a little bit invisible. Um, and the, the, one of the benefits you get from that is that if you happen to forget a certain code path, um, it's still gonna benefit from, from the circuit breaker because um, just because it's happening at such a low level. And um, if you have two, for example, you have two different services that use the same backend, so let's say you have two services, based on them, where both of them use Redis as a backend, then they basically, because you implement this at the driver level, they share the same state which means if one of the services seeing, is seeing errors, that will benefit the other service as well. So, um, yeah, as I said, you would, um, you would basically um, define a new type of exception, so we call it a circuit open exception, and um, the application code itself doesn't actually know anything about circuit breakers, um, which means you don't have to uh, change all the other code. Um, I'm gonna come back to this later with an example to make it more clear. So, Another pattern that's uh, closely re related to uh, circuit breakers is the idea of failing gracefully. So we, when we had this uh, series of outages a while ago, we, we tried very hard to fix all the problems and fix all the root causes and make sure that we don't go down. But then eventually you have to realize that there's always something that's gonna happen, you will go down, and you should spend an equal amount of time preparing for that and, as, uh, and making sure you know what will happen if, we, if you go down, because you, you just can't fix all the problems. So um, the idea is to fail gracefully. So um, something that I often heard when I started working on Rails is don't be defensive, don't rescue all, this, all those exceptions. Um, if this happens, we have bigger problems. Like, don't, just don't bother, just code for the happy path and don't assume any errors, um, which is, fair opinion and in terms of like developer productivity, but um, I would say in some cases it's bad advice. So um, my, um, what I want to illustrate is that sometimes it can make a lot of sense to be defensive. Um, and to illustrate what I mean, let's look at this example. So this is um, a Shopify storefront. We, uh, so Shopify runs, um, is an e-commerce um, platform as a service. Uh, so we, we allow people to, to build their own online stores. And um, if you look at what kind of services are actually involved in this, um, you have a couple of things. So we have a couple of redises here. We have cards, we have sessions, we have inventory, um, we have caching. And um, if, you, if you build all of this in a naive way, then every, an error in every single one of those components would break the entire page and just um, yeah, serve an error to the, to the browser. 
Um, <clears throat> but if you actually think about what happens here, um, there's often a lot of different reasonable fallbacks that you can do instead of serving an error. So maybe um, if we look at the card service at the top, so if I have something in my card that's going to tell me how much how much um, uh, how much money that it's worth. So if the card service happens to be down, instead of breaking the page, I could just not show this box at all, or say just pretend it's zero dollars. That's um, that's a little bit inconvenient if people can't put stuff in their card, but that's better than breaking the page and then. If you have this fallback, then at least people can still look at the product and can at least browse around. So the, the idea is to um, yeah, degrade the user experience, which is always better than breaking it completely. Um, and you might say that some services you have, there's, there's no reasonable fallback. It doesn't make sense to, to do anything in an error case. You just have to make sure it, that it doesn't error. But if you think about it for a little bit, you will actually be surprised by how many compromises you can make that will um, keep you alive. So a couple of examples that we ran into. Um, we use Elasticsearch for um, product searches on the storefront. So if the search system uh, happens to be down, we just return an empty result set, which is not the best user experience, but it's better than to break the entire um, storefront. Um, if the session store is down, you can still do a guest checkout, which is also less convenient, but still better than being down. Um, if maybe you have a, rec a recommendation system, so instead of showing personalized recommendations, if this personalized recommendation service is down, you can still, maybe you could still show generic recommendations. Um, something that we use for a couple of things is distributed logs. So um, think of it as a service that makes sure that um, no two processes run the same code path at once. And if this lock is unreachable for some reason, Instead of breaking the code path that is trying to acquire the lock, you can just pretend that somebody else has it. Um, yeah, there's lots of other examples. So maybe you do A-B testing. That's something that we did. Um, A-B testing basically just, it's like a data, data analytics thing where you divide, in our case, shops into two groups, a test group and a control group. And previously, what we would do if we can't determine if the service that, that tells you which group you're in is down, we would break the entire page. Um, but it actually makes more sense to just assume that, just assume one of the groups. Um, so there's all these kinds of um, graceful fallbacks that you can do that uh, degrade user experience, but much better than, um, than errors. Um, yeah, so same as with a circuit breaker. Actually, if you, if you implement this, uh, often you would implement the, those two things kind of together because they're very related. Um, so same here, uh, try to push it as, as, as deep down the stack as you can, which sometimes is tricky because um, the, the fallback for a certain service that makes sense in one area of your application might not make sense in another area, so you might want to have different fallbacks for, for the same service. But um, in our experience, if you, if you write very good abstractions, then this is not really an issue. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a nightmare to maintain this at a higher level. Um, so something that's a little bit that you need to watch out for is monitoring and alerting because um, if you have those fallbacks in place everywhere, um, you might not know if you have a problem. So um, a lot of people probably um, use something like um, uh, air break or um, any kind of like um, error reporting system where on each exception that happens in your code, you're going to uh, notify a chat channel or send an email or something. If you're rescuing all those errors and you have fallbacks and something actually goes down, you're not seeing any errors. So you still, even though you have, you have good fallbacks for everything, you still need good monitoring and good alerting to, to know that something is wrong even though you're not serving errors to the customer. So that, that's, that's very important. Um, so there's one piece of Ruby code that I have. Anything, everything else is not really specific to Ruby. Um, but this illustrates my point about a couple of things. So um, we have this data store, and as I said, we implement the circuit breaker, and now we have a circuit open error, which is um, a subclass of the whatever the client's base error is. Then you have the service. Um, for example, we have a shopping cart here. And um, so if there is an error in, um, with the data store, then the, the shopping cart rescues the base error, which also, also catches the, the circuit breaker error. So um, the important point I want to make here is that it's very important to have good abstractions, 
And um, as you can see here, the, the shopping cart itself doesn't know anything about circuit breakers. That's an implementation detail of the client. And then the, the, the Rails controller doesn't know anything um, about the data store. That's also an implementation detail. So um, it's very valuable to um, not couple those things together and um, come up with proper extra abstractions. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to, to deploy all those um, resiliency patterns. So the next one I want to talk about is called bulkheading. And the, the name comes from, um, from, from, uh, from a boat where you have those chambers in the boat to make sure that if one of them fills up with water, it doesn't spill over into the other one and, take the, and sink the whole boat. But um, it isolates the, the failures of one area and makes sure it doesn't lead to cascading failure in other er uh, areas. So the main idea is isolate the failures. Um, this is a little bit of um, more like an operational concern, not so much about um, a software design pattern. And um, it, it's a little bit vague, but there's a lot of examples that you can do here. So something that we got a lot of value out of is um, limiting concurrent access to a shared resource. So maybe you have, um, let's say you have a monolithic Reds application. Maybe you have um, one database server and 50 app servers. Um, and you don't actually want to allow all those 50 app servers to talk to the database at the, at the exact same time. And in the, in, in the most Rails application, that's totally unnecessary. Um, not most, most of the time, it's usually not spent in the database. So what we do is we, um, we implemented a system based on semaphores, um, which is this um, concurrency data structure. It's basically like a, you can think of it as like a ticketing system. So we, you would say um, we have uh, 50 app servers, but we only have 20 database tickets. And if you want to talk to the database, you're going to go get this ticket talk to the database. When you're done, you bring back the ticket. And if there's no tickets available, you have to wait for someone else to bring back his ticket. Um, and you, you're doing this all at a very low level, so the, the application code doesn't see anything of it. But what this does is if there happens to be a, a super slow query that's blocking the database and all the requests are taking longer, and now there's 50, uh, 25 um, app servers stuck in the database waiting for it to return, it makes sure that all the other 25 app servers are not hammering the database even more. So this is, um, yeah, this is about making sure that an error in one area, so a slow query in this page, is not going to um, make it even worse in, an other, in another area. So the, the idea is similar to circuit breakers by saying that um, you want to give the, give the service time to heal. Um, and there's lots of other uh, examples here. So um, something that um, we often see is people have um, different applications, but there's only one database server. And this one machine runs several databases all for the same, uh, for all those services. And then if, if one, so the problem with that is, of course, that if one of the applications overloads this database, then that's going to affect all the other ones. So this is something you want to avoid. The same is um, true for Redis um, or MySQL. Uh, Redis, for example, has this concept of a logical database where you can say, it's, a, it's basically a different key space, but it's still the same process. Um, and this is bad um, because, as I said earlier, Redis is a single-threaded um, architecture. So even though they're in different logical databases, um, something that causes problems in one of those logical databases is, gonna, is not isolated from the other ones. So you want to make, make, make sure that those things don't impact each other. Otherwise, if there's a problem in, in one area of your site, it's going to triple into all those other areas that you didn't, didn't even know were related. Um, <clears throat> some, one interesting uh, um, thing that we found out recently, um, we, we have this one area where um, we have this, yeah, there, there's one area of our site that um, we do uh, load testing in, and um, if there's errors in that area, that it doesn't actually affect any customers, but it does enqueue a lot of error reporting jobs. And so we were hitting this one uh, area a lot and enqueuing a lot of error reporting jobs, and this actually overloaded our, our, um, our, our entire queue. So this is like one example where problems in one area can kill, kill another area, and you, wanna, you really want to watch out for those kind of things. So this is all very, um, it, it can be all very uh, overwhelming. You don't know where to start. If you, when we, when we first started looking into this, there were so many things um, that were like eye-opening, and um, it seemed like everything was broken, and we, there was 
we needed to apply those patterns everywhere. And Shopify is a pretty big um, code base, and so we were kind of lost. We didn't know where to start. So what, what we found valuable is to um, look at the hot paths, um, look at everything that has the most traffic, because that's also the, the area that can, can do the most damage if there's, an, um, if there's a problem, because that problem is going to be uh, hit by a lot of requests. Um, every application has this one area where if this area is down, you're going to lose money by the minute, so that's, that's it's also something you want to you focus on. Um, something that's often forgotten is deploys. So we had to spend quite some time to make sure that we can always deploy. Uh, so it's, it's very bad if you, can, if you ship some code and this code breaks something and you can't revert it because the deploy isn't working anymore. Um, so we spent quite some effort uh, to make sure that we can, um, the, the main Shopify application, we can deploy it even if all the other services, even if the database is down, we can deploy. And that's not super easy. It's very easy in a Rails application to, to break this and to accidentally add something for example, in like a Rails initializer that talks to the database. To the database. So you, you want to make sure that nothing in your initialization process depends on any of the other services. Um, yeah, and the, one of the most important devices is don't try to do it all at once, but come up, try to come up with a step-by-step -step plan how to, how to do it. And um, something that we found valuable for that is um, we made this thing that we call a resiliency matrix. So it's basically just a table, and the columns are the areas of your site that, um, that you have, and the, the rows are the services or the data stores or the dependencies that your site has. And then in each cell, you just write down um, what you think happens to this area if this service is down. So then when we first did this, we were pretty surprised by, by first of all, how much of it was read, and then also how much of it we, we didn't actually know what the status was. We didn't even know how to find out. So you want to, I would say, just start with writing this matrix um, just with assumptions, what you think is, is your current state, and then try to verify those assumptions, and then get this matrix as yellow or ideally as green as possible. So this brings us to the next uh, part I want to talk about, which is resiliency testing. So obviously, um, testing is a great tool for making sure that you're not breaking something that you already fixed in the past. But it's also, for us, it was incredibly valuable as an exploration tool. So if you already have an application with a good test coverage, you can use this to, in our case, generate a to-do list of things that need to fix. So what I mean by that is we never had this requirement for our code to be resilient. But by introducing something new to our test suite, we were able to generate a to-do list of things that, um, that need fixing. And then this allowed us to approach this very iteratively and one test class at a time, basically, and not, try, not get overwhelmed. So um, we actually used this kind of idea, this, this, tool, this idea of using your test coverage as an exploration tool um, a lot in other projects as well, and it's super valuable. Um, so what I mean by this is we have this, um, we have this module that we wrote. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how the module works. If you're interested, you can, you can talk to me later. But the basic idea, the basic thing it does is it does some Ruby meta programming to make sure that if you change code or if, if there is code that's being tested that talks to a service or um, a data store, so in this case, for example, Redis, if there's any code that violates those uh, requirements that we have, it's going to make the test fail by saying, hey, this, this code is not um, specifying um, a fallback. So you're talking to the service without saying, without catching errors, without saying what should happen if the service is down. And um, basically, the, the way we approach this problem is we just pick the test class, so the cards controller test here, include this module, fix all the tests of that module that were broken in this way, and then ship this as one pull request in one contained unit, basically. And then we moved on to this with the same, with the next uh, test class, and then the next and the next. So this allowed us to get a lot of visibility because you have this list of failing tests, and also you have a to-do list of things that you need to, um, you need to work on. Um, so this is good in one way because it tells you which code is not 
checking for the errors, but something that it doesn't do is it doesn't actually test the error code path. So it's still, if this test is passing, it doesn't mean that the error code path is working. It just means there is an error code path. Um, so something that you might do in your integration tests is, um, uh, Sam was talking about mocking earlier, so maybe you're mocking, uh, maybe you have an HTTP call, and maybe you're mocking it to return a 500 error, or maybe you're mocking it to return a connection refused to make sure that the test is, um, that the code is handling this error. But we found that mocking those kind of network calls can be a little bit tricky because often you don't really know which level to mock on. Like, do you want to, if you do an HTTP call, do you want to mock like the net HTTP library or do you want to mock on the TCP level and which one is more realistic? So we, we, um, uh, we came up with a tool um, that's, uh, that we call Toxy Proxy, and um, it's very simple. Uh, you, could, you can implement it yourself if you don't want to use ours. The idea is basically that you have this proxy process. It's a separate process running besides your test suite, and um, your application in your test environment is not actually connecting to the database, for example, or the Redis server or the, the service you have. It, 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 connects to, it connects to this proxy, and the proxy connects to the actual um, backend. And then in your test suite, you can, you can say, um, toxic proxy MySQL down, which means that the connection to the database is actually interrupted. Um, this down basically tell, sends, sends a command to the proxy saying, hey, please shut down the MySQL connection. And this gives you the most realistic test that you can do in this way, much more realistic than mocking because the connection is actually down now, you're not just pretending it's down. And um, yeah, so we basically, after we, we this, this, is the, this is what you want to do to make sure that the error code path is working as well. So we have a uh, bunch of areas that are super important um, to us. And um, so for example, we want to be able to serve cache hits even if the database is down, which seems kind of obvious, but um, again, in Rails, it's very easy to accidentally break this kind of stuff by introducing new database calls that maybe you didn't really have visibility of. Um, and yeah, we, we just found that this kind of um, resiliency testing is very, very useful for this kind of stuff. Okay, so the, if you've done all the testing and you fixed all your code, then there's a the last step, which this is the step that we are still in a little bit. Um, and uh, it's called Keras Monkey. So the, the idea is that you have this monkey running around in your data center, pulling out cables, shutting off servers, and you want to be able, you're so confident in your application that that doesn't bury you at all. Um, so the way you can approach this and the way we did it is that um, you first do it manually, so you, you do all this resiliency testing and once you have some level of confidence about um, this area of the application, so for example, you're confident that you can lose one of the three database um, readers or something like that. We would go in and actually, in production, just kill one of those nodes or add a firewall rule to partition it from the others, fill up the disk or like any kind of stuff that can actually happen in production. And um, even if you're not exactly sure what's gonna happen, it's still better to experience this kind of problem in a setting where everybody is already sitting in the same table and everybody is ready to, to start fixing and ready to unbreak it. Um, that's much better than uh, being woken up at 5 a.m. in the morning by this. So, um, the last step, once you're super confident that this is not a problem, you can automate it. We're not quite there yet, but um, there's um, a couple of companies, Netflix, for example, who actually do this in an automated way. So they, they, they would go in and automatically, like at a random time in the middle of the night, shut down half the servers in one of the regions or something like that. Um, so if you, if you can get to that state, that's pretty great. Um, Okay, so I, I skipped over a lot of the details. Um, so I want to give everyone here who thought this was an interesting talk, I want to give you a little bit of homework just to get you started with this and to show you that it's not complicated and there's a lot of easy wins to get. So for your homework, if you don't do anything, at least add timeouts because that's super simple, super easy, and it can already make a great difference. If you're interested in how the circuit breaker thing works, um, Implement it yourself. It's, it's not as complicated as, as it might seem. It's maybe you, you can do it in like 50 to 100 lines of Ruby code. Um, if, you, if you are in charge of, um, or if, you, if you're running an application, um, create this resiliency matrix just by like filling in the cells with what you assume is the behavior and then write some tests to make sure if that's actually what you think 
uh, if, if it's actually behaving the way you think it is. Um, and then if, if you're still interested and if you want to learn more about like Ruby metaprogramming or if you want to take this, make your tests um, generate a to-do list for you kind of approach, implement this, this module that I showed. Um, and if, if you want some pointers how to do that, you can talk to me later, later after the talk. Um, yeah, um, and if, you, if you're still interested after that, there's this great book called Release It, um, which covers a lot of those uh, things that I talked about today and a couple of others. So there's a lot of insight here. It's, it's kind of um, a little bit specific to the Java ecosystem, but um, there's still a lot of uh, valuable stuff in there. Uh, the same for the Netflix tech blog. They have a great library, um, also for the JVM, but you can learn a lot from the ideas even if you write a Ruby application. Toxy proxy, if you want to look at that gem, is the one to, that we use for resiliency uh, testing. Um, earlier I talked about um, this idea of concurrency control to make sure that um, some shared, some, some, some service that is used by more than one application or by more than one work or the same application to make sure that not too many of those are talking to the service at once. Um, our implementation of that idea is called Semyon, if you want to check it out. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you very much, Florian.